Hi, I'm Susan Matthews. Welcome to the Subverse, where we uncover stories that lie in the margin and journey from the cosmic to the quantum, from cells to cities. In this episode, we speak about proteins and our human biology, comparing it with the art of origami. We speak with Sudha Neelam, a research scientist in the field of cell biology based in Houston, Texas. She studies the mechanisms of protein synthesis and how misfolded proteins cause disease. I came across Sudha's work when we were doing an animation on our website for a poem called Animal Origami. I found an article that she had written on protein folding, comparing it with paper folding, and just found it fascinating. As she mentions in our conversation, this connection has been made before that the way proteins fold into a 3D structure is so similar to how a flat sheet of paper turns into a beautiful origami crane or butterfly or any other shape. For me, the simplicity and elegance of life and art never fails to amaze. I especially like how she evoked a handy visual for protein folding in our conversation as a chain of beads. Amino acids are the beads linked in a protein chain If we had to place the beaded chain in a small box, we would have to fold it, like how proteins fold in the body, finding a stable niche in a small space. At the end of our conversation, she speaks to how we need to take care of our bodies and respect ourselves. I agree, and I think we need to treat it as we would these beads, as something so fragile and so tremendously precious. Hi Sudha, welcome to the Subverse. Hi Susan. Thank you. I wanted to start by asking you about your background and what brought you into cell biology and also any experiences that you had with paper folding. I basically grew up in a small town in India in southern India, um, Tirupati to be precise. I had a very imaginative childhood. As a child I would uh, spend a lot of time observing things making up stories and i lived in a imaginary world as a kid i was always attracted to how the human body works and functions right from my childhood i was always curious about how the body interacts with the environment how we basically function as humans and how our body when it gives up or when something goes wrong everything comes to a standstill uh, when you get sick or when you get a cough when you get a cold you just don't feel yourself and you don't you can't function nothing else matters at that point also interested in the nature i as i said i grew up in a very imaginative world of my own looking at the sky accounting the stars literally like there were days when i would just go up and onto the rooftop we call it the terrace and look at the sky and then count the stars and just wonder what exists beyond and one of the things that i really enjoyed doing in the in the town i grew up in was making paper boats when it rains we didn't have a lot of snow or uh, many seasons the only two seasons we had were summer and monsoon it was hot most of the times and occasionally it would rain and sometimes it would rain a lot and those days i would make paper boats and i would see them float in the water in the little puddles and that was probably my first experience with paper folding and back then i didn't know that there is something called origami or uh, there was a whole art form of paper folding So I just casually made paper boats. One time I learned to make a slight modification on that paper boat. I later on I came to know that it's called a, a fin boat or a paper fin boat in origami. It has a little sword like thing in the bottom. I was very fascinated by that model and I thought hey this is something interesting something different from what I'm used to making and I also realized that that boat would not float on the water because it has something sticking on its bottom so i was disappointed 
and also frustrated with it. But later on, many years back, when I uh, took up biology and I started studying about cell biology, I came to know about proteins. I learned that proteins fold themselves just like you would fold a piece of paper. And sometimes these proteins can misfold or they don't fold properly or they have something extra sticking onto their sides, just like the paper fin board, which has an extra thing sticking on its bottom. And that makes them not function properly, just like the paper board won't float properly. So I kind of connected my memories back to my childhood paper board. And then I thought there is some similarities between folding a paper and folding protein. And later on, when my son was in his teens, he started doing origami. And that's when I learned more about it. And that's when I could see the similarities between the two art form and the science. It, this is so fascinating. I've made paper boats too, but I don't think I've ever made the fin boat. Yeah. So I, like I said, I was always curious and I would meddle with things and I just don't like being normal. I want something to change. Um, I, was, I was always very curious and I would like, what happens if I move this around? What happens if I add this? Okay, how can I be different? How can I make this something different? And uh, I think that's how I got interested into research and science, because I would get really bored if I can't think and go wild with my imagination. <laughs> that's amazing. I'm just curious about the whole process of protein folding itself, if you could just explain it to us. Okay. So most of the times when you think of proteins, you think of the dietary proteins, like, you know, you're taking a protein rich diet, this has high protein. Um, you think of a piece of chicken or, you know, uh, something delicious. So the dietary proteins that we take, they have what are called as amino acids. So proteins are basically a sequence of amino acids. So the amino acids that we intake, they are all put together in a certain sequence. And how they are arranged and what the sequence is determined by a genetic code. So once uh, the amino acids are arranged in a sequence, what we have is a long string of amino acids. That's basically the protein. So you can imagine proteins as long chains of amino acids. So we have 20 different amino acids, and then there are various combinations of these 20 different amino acids. So uh, different proteins have different amino acid sequences, and based on the amino acid sequences, uh, they have a specific function. And again, how these amino acids are arranged, which protein gets what amino acid, all of that is imprinted in our genetic code. So uh, now we can say, okay, we have the sequence of amino acids, we have the protein, now why bother trying to fold it? And then why bother about misfolded proteins? Why can't we just have that one sequence of amino acids? So if you can think of uh, the long sequence of amino acids as a long string of beads. And let's say you want to put that string of beads in a little box. So you would either end up folding it or, you know, turn, twisting it into a coil so that it just fits and is safe and secure inside the box. So that's exactly what our body is trying to do with this string of our chain of amino acids. So we have more than like 100,000 proteins in our body. So all of them have to fit in properly and they have to be in a stable form and uh, they have to do their job. So in order to make sure that uh, everything is snug and tight and cozy within our body and doing exactly what they're supposed to do, um, these proteins have to fold themselves. So what happens is the protein folding process, the long string of amino acids, they form what is called a helix, alpha helix, so which is like the primary structure. And then from that primary structure, they get onto a secondary structure and a tertiary structure and a quaternary structure. So through all of these processes, we finally end up with a folded protein in a specific format, uh, in a specific shape that is stable and functional. And that's why the shape then defines the function? 
or the function defines the shape? So it's kind of mutual. The way they are folded is such that, you know, again, these amino acids again have things hanging around them. So the way the protein is folded or the way the protein is shaped, it is designed and shaped in such a way that first and foremost, it has to be stable in, in the environment that it is in. So within our body, different cells and different parts of the body have different environments and extracellular space. So it has to be stable in that environment. And then that is determined by how it is shaped. And then once it is stable, then it has to perform a certain function where sometimes the protein has to interact with another protein around it. So for that, you need to have everything aligned properly so that they both can interact with each other. So the shape is important to, for the stability and also the function and also the way it interacts with the environment and the proteins around it. Thank you, Sudha. And I just wanted to know, so now you've explained how the proteins fold and what that looks like, but then why do they misfold? And why is that then important in terms of like disease and understanding why things go wrong in the body? So why proteins misfold? So like everything in life that is not perfect, 100% perfect all the time, how we all make mistakes and how we all sometimes miss a few steps here and there. Um, the same thing happens with protein folding too. It is not perfect. It, is, it does not work 100% of the time. And just like sometimes we get tired of doing the same thing over and over and, you know, we, we just kind of slip here and there. The proteins slip too here and there. Um, sometimes it could be because of a mutation and because of that mutation, the genetic code that determines what amino acids go where, they can be misplaced or uh, they can get changed or you can miss an amino acid or you can have a different amino acid. Sometimes uh, because of, you know, the way the, the proteins misfold is because of the way the secondary structure or the tertiary structure forms. So it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be the sequence of amino acids. It can also happen in the, in the secondary stage or the tertiary stage. The beauty of this is that our body has a mechanism to get rid of these misfolded proteins. So when it does happen, there is something called as an unfolded protein response. So this mechanism kicks in. And basically, it scavenges all these misfolded, non-functional proteins, and it gets rid of it. So now, if we do have that backup mechanism in place, why then we get a disease or why do we have problems of misfolded proteins? And why do we see some diseases where we have this accumulation of these misfolded proteins? So what happens sometimes is that there is an increase, uh, exponential increase in the presence of these misfolded proteins. And it, the load is so much that the unfolded protein response cannot keep up with it. And so the body cannot keep up with the extent of these unfolded proteins that are being pumped out of the cells. And since they cannot be eliminated, they cannot be uh, discarded, they start accumulating. Now, they cannot function properly and they don't serve the purpose and uh, they're just lying around and they're just getting piled up. So you have all these extra garbage lying around and the cells cannot do what they are normally supposed to do. And that's when you start getting all of these issues with like um, memory loss or like forgetting things that happens in Alzheimer's and then mobility issues that happen in Parkinson's. So accumulation of these uh, excess of misfolded proteins is what causes the disease pathology. Thank you. This is really interesting. And is this the subject of your research presently? Yeah, so right now, currently, I'm working on a misfolded protein that is aggregated in the kidney. So it's a protein called uromodulin. And the patients who um, have uh, this misfolded protein, they 
currently there is no treatment for this. So the, these proteins are just stuck inside the cell and the symptoms are very painful. So you basically treat the symptoms at this point um, or you try to uh, prolong the disease so that it doesn't get to a point where uh, you would need a kidney, kidney transplant. So my research currently is to see how uh, we can make the cell secrete this protein. So how we can get this misfolded protein out of the cell so that it's not stuck inside the cell. So like I said, when these proteins are just sitting inside the cell, they are coming in the way of what normally is supposed to happen. Uh, once they can secrete it and it can just come out and uh, you can eliminate it, and then you can save some of the normal functioning of the cell. That's that's amazing. I think you're really doing life-saving research, so thank you. I don't know about life-saving. Like research is not an area where you have instant gratification, so it takes years uh, to um, get to one step. We'll be back after a break. So how does protein folding compare with paper folding? And how do you see the connections between the two? So I, I think the connection has been made by many people before. So it was not it's not my own idea. That's so I've read many articles where uh, they talk about origami and uh, protein folding and they say it's like the biological folding. For me personally, when I learned to fold and when I see my son doing origami, the one striking similarity that I find between the two is precision and patience. Because the whole thing of having this sequence of amino acids and how exactly which one goes where it has to be very precise. Even one small change uh, can just throw everything away and it will just won't work. The same thing is true for origami too. Even though it seems like you're just taking a square piece of paper and you're folding it, if you are not exactly precise about the inch of paper that you are going to fold, the final structure that you get will not be exactly what you want it to be. So a half an inch off will become a big mistake when you start folding it. So precision is one thing that's very common for both. And just like how you start with a, a flat sheet of paper and then you end up with a three-dimensional structure, you start with a long chain of amino acids. So that can be like the flat sheet of paper. And then this three-dimensional structure, the quaternary structure that you get can be the 3D origami model that you end up with. The other similarity is you have instructions for folding origami. They are called crease patterns, so which, which tell you exactly how many folds and how to fold it uh, and uh, there is something called as a base fold when you start an origami there are different names for these base folds. there's like a bird base a diamond base so that base has to be perfect and once you have a good base fold then you can just kind of build your model on on top of that so that is very similar to having a good or a correct uh, genetic code which will tell you what exactly are the sequence of amino acids and once you have that a uh, long sequence of amino acids or one like similar to the base fold in origami you can build on top of that so once you have the long sequence of amino acids that is correctly aligned then you can start folding it and make the three uh, 3d protein structure all of this needs lots of patience. I think paper folding as much fun as it is, it is not something that you would just sit and do it in a rush. Uh, it is something that needs a lot of patience. And I, I know there are videos and articles on how fast the protein folding happens, but I also feel like everything inside our body is very patient and calm even though that doesn't reflect on on the outside but i think our cells are very patient creatures and i think that's also what origami and these kinds of arts do which is 
that it brings out those more contemplative, meditative parts of ourselves. Have you found that also when you do this? So I have a small story to share here. I don't know if it is meditative, but a couple of years back, me and my son, we always travel to India during the summer. And uh, one time, a few hours before we were supposed to board our flight, I get an email saying that your flight is delayed and we rebooked all of your flights. I'm like, hmm, okay. So then I go to the airport and then I see that the rebooking was just crazy. So we had a flight to Germany and then we had a 10-hour layover in Germany. And then from Germany, we went to Abu Dhabi and we had another seven or eight hours layover there. And then from Abu Dhabi to Chennai. So I was, I was not happy. And I just kept asking, why can't we stay in a hotel in Germany? And, you know, and why do we need to spend 10 hours in the airport? Anyway, after a long discussion, it was just decided that whatever was given to us was the best option. So on that flight, my son carried like a stack of papers and he said, I'm going to fold on the plane. It's a long flight anyway. And uh, he was like, it's okay, we can have a lot of people, we can fold in the airport. I'm like, how long are you going to fold? So anyway, we, we landed in Germany and uh, we had nine hours in the airport. So I was like trying to read, I was looking around and I, I saw that, that he was folding. And I said, I don't have anything else to do. And I'm really mad at, at a situation that I have absolutely no control over. I can sit and get mad and annoy myself. Nothing's going to change. So I said, okay, let me start folding. I think he taught me how to fold a dragon. And uh, I realized that when I was doing that, um, I was not mad anymore, probably because my focus was some like on the piece of paper. And after a while, it, it just felt calming to just fold the paper. Like I started randomly folding it, trying to make my own thing. And I think that experience taught me that origami can have a calming effect on you. And I think why I felt that was if you're reading a book, you're just focused on the letters. Or if you're listening to something, you're just still distracted. And at that point, uh, even when I was reading a book or trying to listen to something, I was still just feeling mad about the whole situation. But when I started folding this, I had to focus on what I am doing. So if I want to make a dragon, if I want to make a crane, if I want to make a bird, there are certain patterns, there are certain folds, and there are certain details that I need to pay attention to. If I don't, then I won't get what I want. So I was like, okay, I need to do this right. So my mind, my hands, my thoughts, everything were just focused on that piece of paper. And then the gratification of seeing that final structure. And then when you look at it and say, oh, I made this, like, you know, I followed the steps and I did everything correctly and I ended up with the right structure. You have shared a picture of this dragon and I must say it's extremely impressive. Yeah, that gratification just makes you happy and then, even if it is for a short period of time, you'll forget the frustration and you'll forget about whatever it is that's bothering you. And it makes you feel good about yourself if you put in the thought and the effort and just kind of fold something beautiful. And it's very easy. All you need is a piece of paper and you can do it anywhere. I think the mind, body and thoughts, they're all aligned when you're doing something like origami. That's kind of my idea of meditation because if you ask me to just sit and focus on my thoughts, it would just go wild. But if I'm just sitting and focused on like folding something, it is meditative, it is therapeutic and it is very calming. And sometimes you can just get your frustrations out just by folding paper. Wonderful. And Talking about origami kind of in a more symbolic way, because I think there's a lot of symbolism also with the craft. And I was reading about one sort of Buddhist priest who did origami. His name is Akira Yoshiwaza. And every time he folded something, he would first pray. 
And he would try to understand the very spirit of the creature that he was creating by studying its nature, its muscular form, its temperament. And he would immerse himself in the creature. And then he was said to have become the creature himself when he folded it. So he would breathe into that paper the life and spirit of the creature. And I just found that to be such an amazing description of what you put into that art. And I think this is what origami also does. There's all this wonderful symbolism. And I wonder that when you do this craft, do you also think about the symbolism of it? So the first thing that came to my mind when you said that he breathes life into the creatures and each creature has a distinct creature, I was just thinking of my protein. And, uh, you know, like every protein has a very unique, form and a unique characteristic and a, a very unique feature that defines it. Sometimes I do feel like when I fold origami that I am creating a creature. It may not be alive, but you, you get the sense of being a creator, even though you're just making a bird or a crane or a dragon or a form of, or a person. But, you know, like you have to shape the legs. You start with this blank sheet of paper and then some fold, a vertical fold you made in the beginning ends up being a part of the leg or a part of the hand or part of the hair or part of a wing. So it does feel like you're creating something. It does feel like you're literally pouring life into a piece of paper and turning it into a three-dimensional structure. And that is very similar to what I feel when I'm working with my proteins and when I'm interacting with my cells, sometimes I talk to my cells in the lab out of desperation, like, you know, come on, work with me. <laughs> you know, just, you know, let's make this work for each other. So I do feel like proteins have their own aura around them and uh, that makes them very special. Whether they are misfolded or properly folded, they are... Um, they are unique and they are very essential for us. For me, it's fascinating how we just take so much of what our body does for granted. Sometimes when my son says he's really tired, I tell him, uh, think of every single cell in your body that's like working right now constantly, nonstop, so that you can function. So you can't really say that you are tired. Yeah, if they take a vacation, then you, are, you will be on a vacation too. I know, Sudha, that you've done a lot of this origami also with your son, and he's a very keen origami master, if I may call him that. And you did share a wonderful article that he had written about origami and feelings. And I don't want to embarrass him or put him on the spot, but if you could share some of what he had said in that article, because when I read it, I just found it absolutely lovely. I think he started origami when he was in his fourth grade around fourth grade. And then it was something that I thought maybe he picked up during one summer and then, you know, kids changed their uh, interests. But this is one thing that he just kept at it and uh, he progressively got better at it. And uh, at one point, it was some school project, I don't remember exactly what, but he said he wants to write about origami and feelings. He said, when you're folding the paper, you're folding feelings and it's like expressing yourself. You can express yourself, your emotions, your thoughts, your feelings through origami and through folding. So that was his idea behind writing that article. And uh, he kind of correlated different folds with different emotions. And he said there is something called a mountain fold or a valley fold where uh, you fold it so that you can you hide something that's underneath it. You hide a certain crease pattern or you hide a certain fold underneath it. And he was making the correlation of how sometimes we try to kind of bottle up our feelings or try to not share our feelings or hide our feelings inside. So it's kind of like that where you just kind of cover yourself up or sometimes you just put up a face because you don't want to share what what your thoughts are. He, he also tells me often that origami is more than just folding a piece of paper. It is like, it, it's like this energy that kind of 
pumps into you when you start doing it. It's like this adrenaline rush that he gets when he starts folding it, which I initially you might everyone might find it weird because you know when you thought, think of adrenaline rush or like getting excited, you think of doing something fast paced or just running or you know just jumping out of the plane or something crazy like that. But he says that it's something that just kicks him and just motivates him and just makes him go for it. Wonderful. If I may just ask you for any final thoughts that you have on protein folding, on origami, or on anything that you think that you would want to share with our listeners. I would like to share with everyone that our body, even though it looks like you know, it's very complicated. In reality, if you just break it down, it boils down to that one cell and the proteins inside the cell. So that's the main thing that just keeps us going. If you can appreciate that, you would appreciate a lot of other things that, that go on inside us and outside us. So knowing that in the end, it's all just that one chain of amino acids, how they are folded, and how they are positioned and how they interact with each other and how that just keeps us going, I think would maybe make us all respect our bodies and how we treat them uh, more. And when I say respect our bodies in the sense that, you know, we all focus on so much that goes outside of us that we don't give our body the rest or the respect or the nutrition that it needs a lot of times that's on the back we skip breakfast we skip lunch we skip sleep we don't take breaks we just kind of glorify this busyness around us and i think it's important for us to sort of i'm i'm not saying we shouldn't work hard or go after your dreams and goals but i think it's a good thing to kind of slow down once in a while and then if you don't want to take a break, think of all the uh, cells and the proteins that are working inside of you. Maybe for their sake, you can just kind of calm yourself a little down, slow yourself a little down. Origami, uh, for me, it started with the fascination of how similar it is to what goes on inside of our body. Kind of a reflection of the invisible folds that happen inside of our body. Like I said, it's important to just kind of respect what's going on inside of our body and take the time to take care of it. Origami might help you just kind of take that break and take care of yourself and your body. So if you find a piece of paper lying next to you, I would strongly urge you to just pick it up and start folding. You don't have to know origami, but if you start folding it, you'll fall in love with it and you'll figure out how to make something out of it. Thank you so much, Sudha. That's absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much. Thanks to Sudha Neelam for sharing her thoughts with us. The Subverse is the podcast of Dark and Light, a digital space that chronicles the times we live in and reimagines futures with a focus on science, nature, social justice, and culture. We have more information about all our guests and their work in the episode show notes on darkandlight.com. You can also follow us on Instagram at darkandlightzine. If you like the show, please tell a friend and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. The Subverse is produced for us by Waka Media. So long. And thanks for listening.